taken that and they've applied buying puts, they've applied uh, selling slightly out of the money call spreads, they've applied calendar spreads, and I even have one person that uh, applied doing a uh, calendar fly where they short the front month, buy two of the second month, and then buy, and then short the third month. And so I, I give you something like that, that at a very basic level, and the people who have done very well with it have tweaked it to their own style or tried to apply it to different markets as well. You're listening to Traders Insight Radio by Interactive Brokers. Find more podcasts and daily market commentary at tradersinsight.news. Please remember any trading discussions are for information purposes only and are not intended to portray recommendations. Please listen to further disclosures at the end of today's episode. Now, welcome to our show. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Interactive Brokers Traders Insight Radio Podcast. And today's guest is no stranger to Interactive Brokers webinar program. Welcome, Dr. Russell Rhodes. How are you, Russell? I'm doing okay. Thanks, Andrew. I'm still getting used to that doctor title. It's just a few <laughs> months old. Well, so. that's that's kind of one of the reasons we're here today to talk about uh, this path of education that you took. So so let's just back up a little bit here. Your, your career has taken you from the Chicago Mercantile's Eurodollar options pit back in the 1990s to becoming a finance professor at where? Where are you? Indiana University, right? Mm -hmm. So so connect the dots for us. What's 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 that journey like? Well, sure. I, I, my journey uh, back in the uh, early 90s was a lot like a, a many people in the Chicago area uh, where you decided I uh, wanted to be involved in the financial markets and got a job, job running around the CME floor, uh, got picked up as a, as a clerk by somebody in the euro dollar option pit uh, two, three months into my short floor career down there. I uh, figured out that I, I really, I, one of the problems with being a, an, an option trader on the floor or working with an option trader on the floor is you're really waiting for order flow to come in. And there's a lot of standing around right. and uh, waiting, which uh, I don't sit still particularly well. Uh, also, when I was at uh, CME Group, they I, I was there when they introduced Globex. Uh, which is pretty much how everybody trades all of those futures. Yeah. Now. I, I feel like I was a big beneficiary of electronic trading coming along. Uh, I, I left the floor, got a master's in ma MS in finance because I felt like that would help me uh, with an upstairs type career. Uh, got a job as an analyst slash trader for a trust department of First Tennessee Bank in Memphis where I grew up. Uh, then transitioned over to working at a hedge fund in Atlanta uh, Caldwell and Orkin, which we we were fairly successful, worked for two or three other hedge funds over a little over a 20-year buy side career, and then uh, just just after the financial crisis, uh, I got hired by SIBO to work in the education division, and that was kind of my retirement from the active trading, uh, and that was in 2009. I uh, was there for about a decade, worked my way up to running the education division there found that I really liked teaching. I had never done it before. In fact, I got hired to write and not teach, um, but uh, SIBO invested an awful lot in me, had people from Medill over at Northwestern come over mm -hmm. and teach me how to answer questions like you're gonna ask me today. And then I also had a close relationship with somebody at Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma State has a an accredited PhD program and when I say accredited, that means that if I work for a business school that's accredited, uh, I don't count as an as someone, even if I'm not a tenure track professor, I don't count against their, uh, let's say, score with respect to how many classes are being taught by somebody that has a PhD. And there are not a lot of people that have some really good experience like I think I do relative to academics and the PhD. So that made me really attractive. I was at Loyola, and then uh, in this past year, I moved over to the Kelly School of Business at Indiana, which I just love. So, so tell us about the whys and the dedication of getting a doctorate. What, what's involved, and how long did it take? Because this 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 wasn't a short period of time, was it? No, and and it did take me a little longer than some other people in in my program. I was not the first one to get through. Uh, it's a it's a program at at Oklahoma State that is tailored toward people that are working full time, and you do three. Uh, semester or three academic years in two years, which means we did a full semester in the summertime. Uh, in fact, there was no break the first two years. And then the third year, you're supposed to be working on your dissertation. And if you follow the schedule, 
you can finish in three years. I was a little bit under five, uh, <laughs> but did finally get it done. And about half the people finish on time, about half the people finish a little bit late. Uh, either way, I'm a doctor now. Very good. Very good. So <laughs> how does earning a doctorate help you today? What's the payoff? Uh, the payoff is I did learn an awful lot about how to go about doing um, really rigorous academic type of research. So, and, and I had been doing research in the past where I would look at things within the market, but I was doing it as a practitioner to try to come up with systematic ways to maybe trade options, systematic ways to trade futures, which is something I did an awful lot of back when I was trading actively. But I had never really... Uh, taken it a step further and uh, rigorously tested things like academics do. Now I do that. I have the ability and the tools to do that. Plus, if you're at a large school like uh, Indiana or even Loyola, uh, the amount, the, the access to data versus professionals is just incredible. And the, uh, you know, the, the, they really are support, uh, schools are supportive of people putting research out that that brings positive attention to the school. And that's one of the things that I'm doing now at Indiana. And, and I guess you, you even get uh, a lot of the students to come to some of the webinars we run, right? I do. I've got, uh, I've, 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 there's always two or three students in my classes that are very interested in yep. uh, the option markets or the financial markets. I, I don't actively, I, I, I kind of keep these two worlds separate. Yes. Uh, yeah. But in, in, Every once in a while, I'll have a couple of students that drop in on a, a webcast, and we recently had one where a couple of students showed up. They asked me the next day in class a couple of extra questions related to the webinar, and then they gave me an idea as to what I should do next month, uh, where where they were missing the information. So that that was good, too. Yeah, and, and, and talk, talking of which, so we'll come to a couple of those case studies in a moment, but mm -hmm. incidentally, folks, these ideas form the backbone of Russell's webinars with interactive brokers. And, and Russell, you told me recently that you don't mind getting beaten up by the audience. Just elaborate no. on, on that and, and how important feedback is to the process. It's extremely important. And, and typically, uh, I'll put a, a high level, here's what I've been working on, and get a lot of really great questions and suggestions during during the webcast. And I mean, you know that that, that uh, if you're one of the hosts of the webcast, you actually get to uh, you. The questions are saved on your hard drive after the call, so I can actually go back through the questions, and as opposed to looking at them with the mentality that I'm going to give you a one or two minute answer and dig more, and then I do respond to some of the people via email that have have sent me. Um, questions as well. But the idea when I do IB webcasts is I, I consider the customers that your client base to be um, at a higher level than a lot of other individual brokerage firm. Um, uh, there's a lot of professionals that do show up on the calls. So I feel like I get really good feedback out of you guys. And then right. it, uh, you know, it's like got an idea, here's the preliminary results. And then I go back and and spend a lot more time based on the feedback I get from you guys. And, and we had some, some very, very good feedback. ibcarwebinars.com, go and have a look at the contributors and then EQ derivatives and, and find any of these uh, recorded webinars with Dr. Rhodes that we're discussing here. We, we did a session very, very recently and Russell spent half of his time just delivering the, the PowerPoint presentation. And then half of the time was feedback and questions from the audience. And I was able to get any unresolved questions over to Russell afterwards. So it's it's a really good collaboration and there's a lot of good two-way flow that certainly helps Russell with future presentations and also augmenting anything that is that he's already um, working on. Um, but walk us through the design of a subject, what the starting point is, where you conceive of a particular notion, and where does the research lead you to? Sure. Um, well. Typically, um, the research is testing something that uh, I think we all are somewhat familiar with within the financial markets or, or a pattern that we see often or looking at, uh, you know, periods when volatility might be overpriced or underpriced. There's a, it, it's typically uh, one of those things that, that we get a feel for just from watching the markets from day to day. And then I go, go about trying to actually quantify it into a, a systematic method of trading the markets. Uh, a prime example is in my baby, the VIX, uh, where VIX futures and the spot VIX will converge 
when we get close to expiration and expiration mm-hmm. is on a Wednesday. Uh, so typically the Monday, Tuesday leading up to that Wednesday, uh, you'll see the front month future trade right in line with the spot index. And so what I looked at was the middle of the week before that, uh, like Wednesday and Thursday, if you shorted the future that's going to expire the following week, could you benefit from it drifting lower and, and matching up with the index? And that works. It's something we see every expiration, but uh, I quantified that it does work if you systematically, and I know sy- following things systematically can be tough, especially in a high volatility market, but if you systematically uh, followed something like that, I think we did that back in the, I, I did an update to that back in the fall. I had, I had originally presented that to IV people maybe five years ago, and it, it has continued to work since then. Uh, so that that's typically, that that's where the idea came behind from that one. Um, we also did something on block option trades. Uh, they say block option trades because with the increased retail pr- presence in the option market, uh, you've got a lot of folks on FinTwit and even CNBC talking about uh, seeing a large option trade and, and trying right. to get into the mind of the trader behind it. Uh, I did a, a, a initial sweep of the biggest block option trades over about a six month period, like a top trade each month. And the results were exactly opposite of what people that want that want you to buy a subscription from them would yep. say. Uh, yep. and, and I've even talked to some of those folks with those preliminary results. And and it's just uh, the just blindly following block option trades. Uh, it's not a really good way to go about uh, trying to profit in the option market. You probably stick w- with what you know instead of. You know, something that you just happen to see. It's so it's yeah. what you're saying is it's, it's it's all well and good following the money. You just got to know where it's going. Exactly, and <laughs> you've got to have an idea behind you know a why. Uh, if somebody's mm. if the biggest uh, option trade is uh, a purchase of an individual equity put, uh, that you know that could just be a very large holder hedging themselves. And mm. even if those puts expire out of the money, they're okay with it because yeah. they ho- well, hopefully they're okay with it because uh, they likely made money off of the stock trending higher. Uh, so you you also have to think about um, yeah you, you have to consider what may be going on behind the option trades. A lot of them were call purchases, which you and I were both very surprised at, mm-hmm. and uh, the success rate was a little under fifteen percent following those trades. Uh, so hopefully and and I, I I'm not on a soapbox or anything, but I really. Uh, want the financial markets to have some integrity to them. Uh, I think speculating is great, uh, but I, I also want uh, people to go in with both eyes wide open uh, when people are telling them there's a certain way to go about making money in the financial markets. That's uh, that's right. You know, yeah. I used to speak to reporters all the time, you know, oh, is this a really bullish trade? What does it mean for the outlook? And I, I don't know. I don't know what the other side of the trade might be or might not be. And yeah. you would just have to monitor it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so then we we, uh, we talked about the the um, the earnings. Let's talk about mm-hmm. that one a little bit. The construct of that because that was a very interesting event. Well, the the earnings announcements in, in uh, this actually it, some of this is in my dissertation, uh, where I took a look at high reputation, low reputation, uh, a bunch of other factors, but then also took a look at um, outlier earnings moves, and I have my own way of defining those. And the way that I define a good earnings announcement or a bad earnings announcement is if the stock moves up more than the the absolute value of the average move over the last four or last eight quarters. So let's say that you know Microsoft on average moves up or down five percent off of earnings. If you get anything above five percent to the upside, I consider that a positive earnings out announcement. Mm-hmm. I don't care if they beat earnings. If they if what I don't care about the fundamentals. Uh, and, and on the other side, if they dropped 6% and, you know, again, that 5% is the average move, I'm going to say that was a negative earnings announcement. And, and in this day and age, a company can put up really good earnings numbers, but if sales look like they're slipping, if they say something somewhat negative on the call, that's actually not a positive announcement. Mm-hmm. So you have to take a look at price action to determine whether something is a positive announcement or not. So how long does it take you to finalize something? <laughs> where, where where do you go with it? Or does it remain open-ended and and, and it needs ongoing research? I, what, what I try to do, especially with like this earnings thing that I'm talking about, or also the, the VIX thing that I was talking about, I want to go far enough back that I go through kind of a, a bearish and a bullish market cycle. So that it's not just the influence of the overall market that is uh, impacting the price reactions that I'm seeing out of the stocks. 
Uh, so that that's one of the things that I like to do. And it it depends on each of the different studies. Also, it depends on how many observations in time periods I can get. With the VIX thing, I go all the way back to 2007 because it's a once a month trade on standard right. expiration. For the uh, block option study that we're doing, uh, I'm going back, I'm using 2019, 2020, and 2021 uh, and the top three trades from each trading day there. It's a very manual process. Uh, one of the great mm -hmm. things about being a professor is I have uh, folks that want to help. I also have a, a budget to help to, to reimburse them for helping me out like that. Uh, that one's going to take some time because it's very, mm. very labor intensive. The VIX one uh, has been a consistently updated one. And the uh, I talked about the uh, earnings, the block option trade or the earnings announcement one. Uh, the good the data that I have goes back to about 2011. So anything that I do around earnings announcements uh, goes back a little over 10 years now. Mm. And um you 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 put out a lot of this stuff for free online. You just tweet it out, right? So, so, yeah. So people don't have to go through the pain that you're going through. Right. <laughs> they don't have to go. But also, uh, you know, again, I find when I share stuff, uh, although Twitter can be pretty brutal, um, that it it help. You know, it just the feedback I get helps me tweak things that I'm working on, or definitely makes me think about things in a in a different way. Than, than than maybe the approach that I was staying was taking, so yeah, I just I put everything. I don't. I mean, I'm I'm just kind of like an open book as far as as all of these things go. I yeah. enjoy being involved in the financial markets. Uh, I do get you know I get consulting jobs where I'll dig into trading certain products on behalf of exchanges. Uh, but for the most part, I'm really just trying to do this because uh, I enjoy it. I like uh, the interaction that I get from it. Um, and I actually had a student ask me, how much do they pay you for doing the interactive brokers webcast? I said, they don't pay me at all. I do it because I really enjoy the feedback that I get when, um, when I do them. It's nice when you reach a point in your career where you do the things that you like, and I'm just doing what I like now. <laughs> yep. So putting this into practice then, yeah. how does an option try to make use of the research? Um, I think what you should do, let, let's, let's go with the VIX because that's just the VIX study because that's a real simple one uh, when we're audio only. But um, the VIX one, uh, I talk about how it, the, the, the system that I have been trading now for some time and that I, I share with everyone uh, involves uh, shorting the front month VIX future on Thursday and getting out of that short on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, now, there are things that, that come into play with respect to screening that. For instance, if the VIX future is at a discount to the index, don't trade. Because the whole, the whole idea there is the index and the futures contract converging uh, early the following week. And if the index is at a discount, well, then you would expect the future to, barring a volatility event, the um, index to move lower. People have taken that and they've applied buying puts, they've applied uh, selling slightly out of the money call spreads, they've applied calendar spreads, and I even have one person that uh, applied doing a uh, calendar fly where they short the front month, buy two of the second month, and then, buy, and then short the third month. And so I, I give you something like that, that at a very basic level, and the people who have done very well with it have tweaked it to their own style or tried to apply it to different markets as well. But that that's, I'm not, I don't want somebody to listen to me on an interactive Rotors webcast and then blindly replicate what, I, what I'm showing. I want you to, to take it, look at it, maybe even paper trade it, get a feel for what, what it is I'm talking about. Make sure it matches up with your personal risk parameters. Um, but that's, I mean, that I feel like that's how uh, futures or options traders can try to take advantage of some of the things that I talk about. That, that's been a fantastic look at the man behind the doctor. So, Russell, thank, thank you very much for joining us. Don't forget, folks, Dr. Rhodes is a, is a regular webinar presenter with us. You can find the many prior events, as I explained earlier, by looking under EQ Derivatives on the Contributors page at ibkrwebinars.com. And you can contact Russell via email on Rhodes at EQDerivatives.com. That's R-H-O-A-D-S at EQDerivatives.com. And you can also follow him on Twitter by entering at Russell Rhodes. Russell, thank you very much. Very cool. Thanks a lot, Andrew. 
Okay, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Traders Insight Radio. As always, there's more content at tradersinsight.news. And if you're interested in learning more about interactive brokers, visit ibkr.com. We offer more trading education materials such as webinars at ibkrwebinars.com, market-related courses at tradersacademy.online, and quant-related articles at ibkrquant.com. Options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. For more information, read the characteristics and risks of standardized options, or ODD, which may be accessed through the link found in the show's notes or podcast description page. Futures are not suitable for all investors. The amount you may lose may be greater than your initial investment. Before trading futures, please Please read the CFTC Risk Disclosure. A copy and additional information are available at ibkr.com. Trading on margin is only for sophisticated investors with high risk tolerance. You may lose more than your initial investment. For additional information regarding margin loan rates, see ibkr.com forward slash interest.